In this video, I'm gonna reveal five secrets the hair loss industry doesn't want you to know. To be clear, I'm talking about the entire industry, natural companies, drug companies, even dermatologists. As you'll soon see, deception is rampant on all sides. For background, I was diagnosed with male pattern hair loss in 2007. I wasted six years and $10,000 on treatments that didn't work for me. I eventually found a regimen that improved my hair and outside of the drug model, but it wasn't until I stopped buying scientifically baseless products and started prioritizing education that I finally saw results. Today, I'm a medical editor, peer-reviewed researcher, and I'm also the founder of Perfect Hair Health. And here's everything that I wish somebody had told me when I was first diagnosed with pattern hair loss 13 years ago. If I had this information up front, I would have saved myself years of time, money, and hair. So let's get started. Number one, marketers misrepresent science to sell us things that we don't need. And specifically, they do this through two key tactics of deception. First, they cherry pick data. They only show us studies that make their supplement, topical, or device look amazing, even if those studies disagree with the overwhelming body of evidence. And second, they misconstrue study results. They tell us about the amazing findings of certain studies, but they forget to mention who the subjects were, what types of hair loss they had, and how these results probably don't apply to everyday hair loss sufferers like you and me. One of the best, or I guess the worst examples of this in the hair loss world is biotin supplements. If you're dealing with hair loss, you've undoubtedly come across an advertisement for the B vitamin complex, specifically biotin. Just go to Amazon. Look at all of the gummies, supplements, shampoos, and biotin conditioners advertised to help fight thinning hair. What do marketers tell you? Something like this. Biotin is a building block of healthy hair. Studies show that a biotin deficiency is linked to hair loss and that biotin helps promote hair regrowth. Therefore, a daily supplement can be key to fighting off thinning hair. When I read something similar back in 2007, I immediately went out, bought a bunch of biotin tablets, and I started supplementing. After all, I was recently diagnosed with pattern hair loss, I was desperate for a solution, and at the time, I was really apprehensive of starting certain hair loss drugs. I'll save you the story, biotin never gave me any regrowth at all, and it wasn't until years later, after becoming involved in hair loss research, that I finally understood why. Almost all marketers cite the same two papers to claim that biotin is critical for hair growth. The first is a literature review on biotin use for hair and nail changes. The second, it's a study on the rates of biotin deficiencies in women with hair loss. In the first study, researchers reviewed 15 reports of people with biotin deficiencies and thinning hair. In all 15 cases, biotin use led to major hair regrowth. In the second study, a dermatology clinic screened 541 women complaining of hair loss for biotin deficiencies. The findings? 38% of them were deficient. That's more than a third. If we only had this information, our takeaways are that one, many people with hair loss have low biotin levels, and two, biotin supplements can regrow hair. Therefore, it's a no-brainer to start supplementing, right? Wrong. If this was your takeaway, you'd just fallen victim to marketing sleight of hand. I not only cherry picked those studies to misrepresent the data on biotin, but I also deliberately misconstrued both studies' findings. Even better, I did so without lying. Rather, I just omitted key details about each study that would have changed your opinion. And through omission, I'm technically absolved of all legal responsibility. So let's learn how to fight this type of tactics in marketing and dive into each study so that I can show you how to read them properly. In the first study, the subjects in these case reports, well, they're not healthy adults with hair loss. Rather, they're children. They're all under the age of six, and nearly all of them have a rare genetic mutation called a biotinidase deficiency. This condition severely impairs your ability to make and use biotin. It also leads to a rare but temporary form of hair loss known as a biotinidase deficiency-driven telogen effluvium. It's a mouthful because it occurs in fewer than one out of every 110,000 people in the world. That's less than a fraction of 1% of the hair loss population. That's hardly applicable to your everyday a hair loss sufferer who faces hair loss from different sets of causes and thereby requires different sets of treatments. So what about that second study? Well, in that one, 38% of women worried about hair loss were found to have a biotin deficiency, albeit, let me be clear, way more mild than the children in that first study. But the piece of information that I left out, after giving these women biotin supplements, they only saw marginal, if any, improvements to their hair. In fact, in that study, 
biotin deficiencies seem to help improve something known as seboric dermatitis, a scalp condition that can compound with hair loss. But the biotin deficiencies were more associative than they were causative to each women's hair thinning case, which is exactly why the investigators concluded, and I quote, the custom of treating women complaining of hair loss in an indiscriminate manner with oral biotin supplementation is to be rejected unless biotin deficiency and its significance for the complaint of hair loss in an individual has been demonstrated. Ouch. And I haven't even brought up the conflicting studies and evidence, like this study, which found no difference in serum biotin levels for men and women with or without hair loss. Or this 2012 CDC report showing that biotin deficiencies are present in fewer than 10% of US adults. The bottom line, biotin's popularity is not built around evidence. It's built around marketing. And it's not the only vitamin you're being falsely sold. I've done this same exercise for dozens of other micronutrients on my site. Selenium, vitamin B12, iodine, calcium, vitamin E, the list goes on. So don't let marketers manipulate data on sick kids to sell you supplements that you don't need. Take the time to read the studies, be aware of the biases that marketers are gonna try to present. Unfortunately, in the hair loss world, the problems with this don't stop there, which brings us to secret number two. Number two, dermatologists prioritize profits over patient care. Every day, dermatologists encounter a specific type of hair loss patient, someone desperate to regrow their hair, but who's also afraid to try drugs like finasteride. Well, dermatologists have developed a way to treat these patients. They offer them alternative therapies, things like platelet-rich plasma therapy, also known as PRP. This is where somebody draws your blood, centrifuges out the platelets, and then re-injects those platelets back into your balding regions. The goal, to generate inflammation, initiate wound healing, and increase growth factors linked to the growth stage or the antigen stage of the hair cycle. Now, PRP is not cheap. At the same time, clinical studies show that after three to six rounds, people often see a 10 to 30% increase in hair counts. For anybody trying to treat hair loss naturally, that can be a game changer. And that's the selling point behind PRP. But again, if I only exposed you to that information, PRP doesn't sound that bad. Yes, it's expensive, but it's also effective. So what aren't dermatologists telling you? In other words, what have I decided to omit that might change your mind about platelet-rich plasma therapy? It's that other natural interventions can improve hair counts by roughly the same ballpark, and they cost a fraction of the amount of money. For example, microneedling. Microneedling works the same way as PRP. It generates acute inflammation, it initiates wound healing, and microneedling can be done at home. So there's no need to see a dermatologist every month. How much does PRP cost? Two to $4,000 per year. How much does microneedling cost? $15. That's right, $15. You can buy a medical grade microneedle roller for less than 1% of the cost of PRP. To me, this difference is ridiculous and other ethical investigation groups agree. Things like this are actually what motivated Ralph Trueb one of the biggest names in hair loss research, to publish a paper exposing these incentives that make dermatologists try to sell people into bad treatment recommendations for hair loss, all to the tune of more money in their wallet. Every year, this problem gets worse and worse. As dermatologists have a harder time burying poor patient outcomes from PRP, they begin to bleed into the next new intrabody-derived therapy, PRP plus A cell, adipose-derived stem cells, and now the biggest thing is exosomes. The cost for these therapies are exorbitant. I mean, I've worked with clients who have paid over $12,000 just to try them, unfortunately before they connected with me. But what they don't know is that regardless of these intrabody therapies, the clinical data all nets them around the same outcome, 10 to 30% increases in hair counts. I mean, just look at the highlight photos from one of the only studies published on stem cell for hair loss. Does that look like a $5,000 result to you? Or these photos from this PRP study? I mean, that doesn't feel like a fair trade-off to me. And don't even get me started on the YouTube dermatologist claiming 99% success rates for things like PRP plus A cell. These guys don't publish their results in scholarly journals, and they also don't respond to interview requests. Maybe because so many of their clients have had a bad experience, and if they did have the interview, they might be exposed. And this brings me to my next point. Number three. For most men, the drug finasteride works wonders. If you've ever visited a hair loss forum, like Hair Loss Talk or even Reddit's Tressless, you've undoubtedly come across heated discussions around the drug finasteride. Is it safe? Is it effective? Are the side effects permanent? 
It seems like everybody on these boards has what's known as an absolutist position. Some claim that the drug gave them brain fog, erectile dysfunction, impotence, and depression. Others claim that people like this are delusional and they should be checked for a mental disorder. A word of advice, if you want the truth about finasteride, don't go to an anonymous public hair loss form. Rather, take the time to read the clinical studies on the drug and the hair regrowth because there is an overwhelming amount of data on finasteride. What does it show? In studies with thousands of people in both the treatment arm and the placebo arm, one, finasteride stops the progression of pattern hair loss for 80 to 90% of men. Two, finasteride leads to a 10% increase in hair count and significant hair thickening. And three, finasteride's rate of side effects are lower than you might expect. In one of the largest studies conducted on the drug, 1.8% of the men in the treatment group reported side effects, and 1.3% of men in the placebo group reported side effects. That's just a 0.5 percentage point difference. And to me, that feels relatively and biologically insignificant. In fact, other studies have shown that simply by telling a patient that finasteride can cause side effects, their risk of reporting those side effects increases by 500%. The implication, a huge number of these side effects might actually be psychosomatic. And these types of findings are not uncommon in research. And the effect actually works both ways. For example, some studies on minoxidil show that men regrew hair in the placebo group. Some studies on finasteride show that men lower DHT levels while taking a sugar pill. The mind is a powerful thing. And I often wonder if people had no education on finasteride, if the drug might have a slightly better reputation online. So when reading these message boards, remember that these forums suffer from what's known as the Yelp effect. In other words, you're way more likely to review a restaurant after a bad experience than you are after a good experience. Finasteride is the 86th most prescribed drug in the world. Think of all the people who see great results and yet don't review the drug at all. Even still, if you are worried about side effects, there's plenty you can do to mitigate your risks. For example, reduce the dosage. Finasteride has a logarithmic, dose-dependent response curve for DHT reduction. That's just a fancy way of saying that a little bit of finasteride has nearly the same effect as a lot of finasteride, and you don't need to expose yourself to high amounts of the drug to see a positive impact on your hair. So if you're concerned, start with 0.2 milligrams of finasteride daily instead of one milligram daily. That's what they prescribe in Korea, and they get great results. Number two, try topical finasteride. When formulated properly with liposomes or chitosans, this can help isolate the effects of finasteride mainly to just the scalp skin. That means less systemic absorption and potentially fewer side effects. Number three, try mesotherapy finasteride. This is when finasteride is injected straight into your scalp. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it requires a dermatologist, but with the limited data so far, it seems like there are great patient outcomes and no reports of sexual side effects. If you're dealing with pattern hair loss and you don't want to try finasteride, that isn't the end of the line for you. Which brings me to my fourth point. Number four, if you don't wanna use hair loss drugs, there are other options. No, I'm not talking about PRP, low-level laser therapy, or natural hair loss supplements, topicals, devices, or shampoos. Most of those things aren't worth their costs in hair recovery. Most of those things don't regrow a lot of hair at all. I'm talking about interventions that are essentially free to try and that have some degree of evidence supporting them. We've already covered one of them microneedling. A growing body of research now shows that microneedling can help improve a variety of hair loss types, ranging from androgenic alopecia to alopecia areata to scarring alopecias. The cost, $15. The time investment, 15 minutes once every one to two weeks. The expectations, about a 10 to 15% increase in hair counts over a three to six month window. Now, to be clear, microneedling is not a replacement for FDA approved drugs, and it works better when it's combined with other treatments. But it also works in similar ways to PRP, seems to be somewhat effective, and is also free or nearly free to try. Another option that is actually free, Massaging. I personally saw major improvements from a standardized set of pinching, pressing, and stretching based scalp exercises. Most of the people that I've worked with have decided to employ similar tactics. In fact, you can see dozens of their progress photos on my site and inside of our membership community. Here, I'm just showing you a fraction of what's available inside, but you get a good idea of what the regrowth can look like. In fact, in 2019, we published a survey-based study on these massages showing that after eight months of adherence, over 75% of participants with pattern hair loss reported a stop or improvement in their hair loss, with a degree of regrowth varying depending on the person. Obviously, the quality of evidence here is relatively low. This is a survey-based study, but the intervention is also free. In fact, 
we give away the exact massage instructions and video demonstrations from that study inside of our free email course on hair regrowth. And you can access that below. So rest assured that even if you're not taking finasteride, you may still benefit from other interventions, ones that you don't have to break the bank trying. This brings me to my last and final point, which I feel is super important if you're gonna dive down the rabbit hole of natural hair loss treatments. Number five, just because something is natural does not mean that it's safe. There are so many examples here, but here are two that relate to hair loss treatments. First, large scale studies have shown that certain natural ingredients, particularly vitamin E and selenium, might be harmful in supplemental form. In one study of over 30,000 people, researchers found that vitamin E supplements were linked to a 60% increased risk of high-grade prostate cancer. For selenium, that number was closer to 90%. And here's the irony. Many men avoid finasteride because they've heard the drug can increase the risk of high-grade prostate cancer by 68%. Yet many of these men turn to natural hair loss supplements things containing selenium and vitamin D as the alternative. They don't even know that they're facing the same, if not a worse risk with the natural stuff. On top of that, many of these men also have no idea about the follow-up studies, which refuted and washed out the link between finasteride and prostate cancer. So they're making these choices off of limited and outdated information. Another example, essential oils. Many people looking for natural treatments often resort to things like essential oils tea tree, lavender, peppermint, rosemary, as an alternative to finasteride. They'll apply them topically to the scalp, and they think that doing so is safer than the drug route. What they don't realize, a recent Endocrine Society report just linked the use of topical essential oils, again, lavender and tea tree oil, to an increased risk of gynecomastia in young boys. In other words, man boobs. Ironically, many people fear finasteride for the same reason. It can lead to gynecomastia in between zero to 2% of users at the five milligram daily dosage. But these alternative essential oils might be just as problematic. Again, just because something's natural does not make it safe. So the bottom line is this, truth is always contextual. If you lack the full context of something, you'll never really know the facts about that. So do your research, learn how to read studies, and prioritize education over product purchases. In doing so, you'll pretty much avoid all of the mistakes that I made while fighting hair loss. And if you'd like to learn more, please feel free to check out my email course on achieving hair regrowth with drugs or without drugs below. It's everything that I wish somebody had told me when I was first diagnosed with male pattern hair loss. And you'll get our free massage video. We'll uncover information about the DHT paradox. We'll dive into the importance of identifying your hair loss types and so much more. Regardless, I hope this video helps guide you in all of the ways that doctors, dermatologists, and even online health gurus failed to guide me. Thanks for watching and best of luck with your hair regrowth.